Welcome to this Roy Morgan webinar on the energy industry. Shortly, I'll introduce Shelley Dennis, our industry director for the energy sector here at Roy Morgan. But let me start by saying that the future challenge energy companies face is a lot like riding a wave. They need to identify the right technology swells, balance innovation, and stay out in front to avoid being wiped out by a disruptive challenger. The old wave of commodity and utility has been replaced by a new wave. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Shelley. As industry director, Shelley Dennis has spent the past 12 months immersing herself in everything energy related. And recently, as part of that, she interviewed a wide range of industry leaders to explore how they saw the energy industry and what was keeping them awake at night. All is about to be revealed. So please join me in welcoming Shelley Dennis. Thanks, Michelle. I'd like to start by summing up the big picture on what is called the renewable energy transition by some and the renewable revolution by others. I will then reveal some insights from discussions held with a number of industry leaders over the past few months before discussing some of the deep data that underpins Roy Morgan's market intelligence on the energy sector. Now, how to summarize this renewable energy transition? It is complex and diverse and actually quite contested. Here are some key issues that describe the current state of the energy revolution. In the face of escalating climate change concerns, decarbonation is and will continue to be a significant priority. Advanced energy storage solutions, such as next generation batteries, green hydrogen and gravity storage help overcome intermittency and grid stability of renewable energy. Decentralized energy networks are essential in the local renewable energy production, such as re residential solar panels and advanced storage. Energy consumers will increasingly become energy generators for themselves, for local communities and for the grid. The energy industry is embracing digital technologies such as smart grids and AI to enhance efficiency, reliability and grid management. Advanced sensors, real-time data analytics and automation allow for more accurate demand, optimized energy and rapid response to grid disruptions. The electrification of transport, homes and industrial processes aims to reduce the carbon intensity of these sectors. From smart buildings to energy efficient appliances, the drive to use less energy has been a constant theme in the economy. There is an increasing focus on ensuring that the benefits of the energy transition reach all parts of society. And this includes addressing energy poverty and ensuring that communities reliant on fossil fuel industries can successfully transition to a new energy economy. So what is the current state of the energy industry that leaders are operating in? It is apparent that business leaders are dealing with multiple and wide ranging challenges and stresses. The environment is dynamic and increasingly regulated. The global pandemic accelerated trends and increased demands on the industry. Consumers are more tech savvy, environmentally aware and emotionally sensitive. And there is a changed government and a focus on regulatory and cost of living pressures. In this environment, the key question from us was whether leaders feel that the current target of net zero emissions by 2050 is achievable. And the result is not an overwhelming yes. It is a cautious and concerned feeling that this goal is probably a stretch. One of the leaders said, I don't think anyone in this energy industry, if they truly said what they believe out loud, believes that they can get there. I think we can make a fair dent. So why do leaders appear hesitant about net zero achievement? Much caution and concern has been expressed in the hard targets given to the industry. So leaders expressed concern that the goalposts keep moving. And considering the enormity of this task, a question is regularly being asked on why can't 90% achievability by then be good enough and celebrated? There is also much debate and wide ranging interpretation on the definition of what net zero really means. There's a skepticism about carbon offsets. Can and should you use offsets? 
which offsets are purely political versus those focused on the true environmental integrity. There was discussion about focusing on energy efficiency versus true carbon capture, where you remove it from the atmosphere. So essentially, the industry is well aware that the interpretations and the manifestations of the definition of net zero is different within the industry. There is also a sense that the goal of net zero is already behind schedule. There's delays in investment models, among other things being cited. We also have renewable energy development skills needed for many of these projects. Think of offshore wind farms. They're in demand, and while they are available, they take time and money to organize, and much collaboration is still needed. Also, the capital and investment costs required for net zero are enormous and are really of massive concern. So what leaders in the industry do agree on is that there is a need to balance renewables, costs and energy stability. The balance of these three things are what keep leaders awake at night. So there's sustainability, there's affordability and there's reliability. We need a balanced approach and not sustainability at all costs. So having discussed some of the industry concerns around new renewables at the top of this pyramid and the achievement of net zero, let me now share what industry leaders think about the other two pillars. So this industry is highly focused on stability. Stability of the overall generation portfolio needs to come from ensuring supply security. Among a range of other examples, these can involve renewable energy generation increasing at the same rate that fossil fuel generation is being removed. Storage capacity for all of this energy has to be ramped up to meet the increased production. Fail-safe options need to be available until the system is stable. This can come via fossil fuels backup, mixing and matching centralized and decentralized storage, flexibility cap capacity and distribution of energy, planning processes in place for the volume storage, and investor strategies in place. There's also a need to get consumers involved and not just rely on government and industry to reach their targets. Fortunately, solar has pioneered a new relationship between provider and consumer. And although solar itself is contested in the industry regarding its current financial and environmental impact, there is no doubt that this has been a conduit to this partnership. The industry is highly focused on costs, from both the cost of living crisis facing consumers, as well as the costs needed to run and grow a business and industry. Leaders note that internal resilience with consumers goes beyond security of supply. Providers need to focus on service, experience, brand and trust. And more specifically, they need to manage distrust. This is all within the context of consumer insights and the cost of living environment. Electrification is undoubtedly the most exciting light at the end of the tunnel from a consumption point of view and a growth opportunity for the industry. Electric vehicle is a powerful option in Australia. Freestanding garages mean that cars can be recharged at home. And in a decade of consumption saturation and solar rollout, the industry is finally on the verge of seeing household consumption increase. And it is guilt-free consumption, or is it? So there was some debate around the short-term gain of electrification versus the bigger picture impact of car productions, battery production, and transportation needs to provide this growth. All these processes which could create further sustainability pressures on the environment. However, Electric vehicles appear to be the critical green shoot of organic energy growth in the industry. The development of alternative sustainable energy resources such as green hydrogen is being closely monitored and investigated by the industry, but with a wary concern for the cost to industry and to consumer. Let's look now in more detail at the context of what everyday Australians tell us about this energy triangle. We'll start off with stability and what we know about Australians that lends to a need for the energy reliability and efficiency needed. The first thing to take note of is that there's been no increase in natural population growth in the Australian population, and there actually hasn't been any for the past two decades. 
This has been fairly consistent at around 150,000 people per annum. In fact, on the right of the dotted line, that's the last year, we see a small but significant drop in natural population growth. So the significant growth in the population is coming from immigrants. And with the lifting of travel restrictions, they're flooding back in. The green dotted line is immigration, which after a plunge during COVID has bounced back, and this has lifted the total population with it. At Roy Morgan, we measure everyone who is connected to electricity and to gas. What we can see from this graph is that current Australian households are sitting at around 10 million, and we have almost 100% connectivity to the grid. Incremental growth in connections is connected directly to the growth in households, driven, as we saw earlier, predominantly by immigrants. And we have 65% of households connected to gas, which is over 6.6 .6 million households. Now, this is as expected in a first world country with some of the best energy provision in the world, but this is still a massive amount of households who rely on regular energy provision. We saw earlier that it's new arrivals from overseas who are creating and filling these jobs. What's interesting in this graph is that pre-COVID, around a third of us worked from home. This is more than I had imagined. And then during and after COVID, that has grown to almost half of us working from home. Now, this is critical because energy provision is central to efficient working from home. Just think about how important your Wi-Fi connections are, security, heating and air conditioning, and any additional cooking that may take place. Speaking about the need for power, if we take a closer look at smart technology, we can see that the home is fast becoming a smarter place. In 2023, a massive 80% of all households have a smart home device or service. In fact, four out of every five Australian households have some kind of smart home device. For most of them, it's a smart TV, that's the red line. When we take smart TVs out of the equation, the number of Australian households with smart home items currently sits at around 40%. This is a massive 10% up on two years ago. The growth even in the last year across all smart home item ownership is undeniable. And I'm not sure if we're getting any smarter, but our home environment sure appears to be. Penetration of smart home items continues to increase across all of these categories. And further to this, one in five Australians now have internet connected home security systems that they check regularly online, a trend that appears to be increasing significantly. And every one of these devices that I've spoken about relies on a robust, reliable and efficient energy system. Now let's move on to what Australians tell us about the economy and what their concerns are. How Australians feel is just as important, if not more important, than how they behave. We have less than 30% of Australians thinking that the economy is improving. That is compared to almost half, 46.8%, only one year ago. Australians are feeling significantly less financially stable than they did a year ago. And unsurprisingly, we see that many, although not all, are consciously cutting down on their spending. So we're in a cost of living squeeze and at least two thirds of the population are looking for deals. The switching of energy providers also saw a significant increase in 2022. This was unsurprising given the war in the Ukraine and the energy price hikes of the mid 2020s. This is what drove the churn. What we can see in this slide is that switches are really very economically sensitive and they're actively searching for alternatives. Those who changed electricity providers in the past year are almost 40% more likely than the total population to look at price comparison websites. And they're more than 20% more likely to look at ratings and reviews before purchasing. And this price sensitivity has increased for these switches in 2022 compared to the previous year. There is no doubt that electricity churners are looking carefully at cost options. So moving on from cost, what do Australians tell us about sustainability and what their concerns are? We can see that more than 90% of Australians try to recycle. 
sustainability has definitely permeated society. Almost 8 in 10 are feeling the pressure to act now and to help the environment. However, we can see as well that three quarters of the population feel that environmentally friendly products are overpriced. The fear of having to pay more is always top of mind. We have more than 30% penetration of some form of solar energy in Australia. This is incredibly substantial. More than 40% of Australians now say they would consider buying a fully electric vehicle. And hybrid vehicles are even more attractive to Australians, with 57.8% saying they would consider a hybrid. This is certainly reinforcing leaders' sentiment that Australian EV is the green shoot of that industry. So we have seen that energy leaders want to make a difference. They are committed to doing everything in their power to achieving net zero and doing so in a way that balances with market and business costs and at the same time maintaining a stable grid. So what is standing in the way of the industry? What is standing in the way of them feeling energized and optimistic? What is standing in their way at the very time that they are having an opportunity to participate in the largest energy disruption that the world has ever and possibly will ever experience. The first thing is regulation. Leaders believe that the substantial amount of regulation is impeding creativity, innovation and future planning. Leaders do recognize that regulations are necessary, but there appears to be an overload that feels counterproductive. They believe too much regulation actually makes it difficult to make confidence decisions because government is getting involved in pricing decisions and price fixing comes with complications and not always solutions. And regulation can be dangerous because if government panics, it becomes even harder and harder for the industry to do something and recover. So other than regulation, leaders are concerned about industry narrative. This narrative is actually critical. Essentially, leaders feel that the narrative being projected by politicians and the media is not open, honest and fair. There is not enough communication around the practical obstacles of reaching the goal of net zero emissions. Schedules are already behind and there is no shared understanding in the industry of what net zero even means. So they believe that the narrative that sustainable energy is going to be cheaper for the consumers is completely misleading and dangerous. For example, they believe that costs are already being passed on to consumers indirectly because capital costs are absorbed by government and industry, which eventually feeds back to consumers and often to those who can least afford it. This narrative also impacts investment into the renewable revolution with investors concerned about putting capital into projects where consumers expect to pay less. Other realities that cost money and are not considered in this narrative include government may need to keep fossil stations running for some time until supply is guaranteed. This is a double up on that supply. Even solar installation, not cheap, and cost is passed on to the industry and to government, which is again passed on to the consumer. Speaking of consumers, this industry is really aware of the commitments to consumers and of doing what is right by Australians. They are really distressed with the sense that consumers are having expectations set that cannot be met. They are concerned with the impact that politicians and media have on industry sentiment because they need consumers and they need investors to support them and work with them on this renewable challenge. They have a desire to empower and enable customers and to provide them with different product options. They also have a real desire to change their relationship with consumers and to become more than just a commodity. Honesty is key and trust is key. Right, so we've heard from leaders that regulation and legislation is impacting the potential achievement of net zero. And we've also heard that the industry narrative as created by politicians and the media is hampering investment and creating unrealistic expectations among consumers. How is this actually affecting the relationship between industry and those consumers? I want to take you through the Roy Morgan Trust and Distrust Survey. We've actually just entered our sixth year of asking over 2,000 Australians each and every month 
which brands they trust and which brands they distrust. And then we ask them why they trust or distrust those nominated brands. And we record exactly what they say in their own words. Trust is the underpinning foundation of brand reputation and of a sustainable future. And that's because when customers trust a brand, they will continue to buy its products or services and they'll recommend it to others and they'll remain loyal. It's however distrust where the deepest fears, pain and betrayal of ours surface. Roy Morgan data on distrust and our lived experience since 2018 shows that distrust can have a very toxic and destructive impact on a brand's reputation. And it also has a material impact on a brand's financial strength. If you take Medibank, for instance, who lost $1.6 billion off of its market value immediately after the devastating data breach. Looking at the most trusted and distrusted industries in Australia, supermarkets and general retail on the left in green remain the most trusted. Telecommunications deteriorated in the last quarter and has replaced social media as the nation's most distrusted industry. That's on the right in red. This change was directly due to soaring levels of distrust for Optus in the wake of its data breach late last year. The utility sector, comprised mostly of energy, remains in the 20th spot on the most distrusted list behind politicians, gambling and real estate agents. If we look purely at trust scores, the energy sector has been experiencing a gradual decline. However, there's a lot of green, which indicates that there are a large proportion of trust coming through for the industry. If we look at distrust, however, we still see far too much red in this industry than what is actually wanted. So if we combine trust and distrust and look at the net distrust score for energy, that's the black line, we see that the deep levels of distrust have kept the sector in the distrusted zone since we first started measuring this almost six years ago. So let's now have a look at five key reasons for distrust in the energy industry and how they compare to distrust among all industries. If you look at the top line, unaffordability and high prices is by far more likely to be the reason to distrust the energy industry than it is on average as a reason for distrust across all the industries combined. Greed, customer service and dishonesty in the energy industry are currently being underrepresented. However, being environmentally irresponsible is a reason for being distrusted and it's overrepresented in this industry. So this basically reinforces leaders' concerns for a distorted narrative around price expectations. And it also highlights the anxiety the industry has should they not be able to meet those targets. This could plunge the industry even further down the net distrust route. Those high levels of distrust and the deteriorating net distrust scores are reflected in the significant drop in customer satisfaction among both electricity providers and gas providers. Now they have had 12 months of almost daily media coverage of cost of living pressures and most customers have faced double digit price rises in their electricity and in their gas contracts. And so the real industry really needs to take consumers on the journey with them. We want the industry to continue creating awareness of renewables and the role of the industry and what part they can play. Plus they need to manage price expectations and be honest. The industry needs to engage consumers digitally and beyond, and this has never been more important and more appropriate. They need to continue building trust and decrease distrust. They need to consider consumers' overall eco-aspirations and lifestyle, and this in the context of greater societal issues such as the cost of living. And they need to educate consumers on energy solutions in their own homes. We really need to advocate to consumers for an industry undergoing overwhelming transition. And on that note, I would like to hand back over to Michelle, who will be discussing some future thoughts for the industry. Thanks, Shelley. That was just fantastic. Now, at Roy Morgan, of course, we're a research company and we ask more than 60,000 Australians each and every year all about themselves, what they think, how they feel, how they spend their dollars and their days. So we have a really good sense of the current status quo for people. 
but we also look to the future. For example, we have an always-on AI forecasting engine that predicts retail spending across every category, at least a year in advance. And our data and social scientists are constantly collating category trends and looking for likely disruptions. So to wrap up today's session, I'm going to share a few of those forward-looking insights with a focus on energy. So the move to sustainable energy and to a decarbonised environment is well underway already. But what does the future hold in store for us? Well, here are a few of my favourite predictions. We will likely harvest energy from diverse novel sources. Think of energy producing paint that transforms buildings into power generators or technologies that capture energy from human movement, heat or even Wi-Fi signals. The advent of quantum computing could introduce new generation and storage methods that we can't even conceive of with traditional science. And as space exploration and commercialisation progress, we may harness the sun's power directly from space. Solar panels in orbit could collect energy unobstructed by the Earth's atmosphere or weather and then beam it down to ground stations. And nanotechnology will create ultra-efficient solar panels, revolutionary battery technology or materials that enhance energy efficiency in buildings and manufacturing processes. And finally, we can expect widespread transmission of power wirelessly over long distances, whether using microwaves, lasers or other techniques. This will liberate devices from batteries and power cords. So that brings this short webinar to a close. Contact Roy Morgan for more insights on the energy sector. Just ask Roy Morgan. And don't miss our previous and upcoming webinars. We bring them to you on telecommunications and other industries. And we'll also bring you the latest results on trust and distrust, sharing some of the best and worst practice examples and how the different sectors are performing. You're also welcome to subscribe to our YouTube channel for a whole range of these and other Roy Morgan data and insights. Thank you for the opportunity to share these insights with you today. See you next time.